Strasdvoitja, and welcome to my second Soviet Union vlog. Um, in this episode, we're going to consider Lenin's initial steps to create a communist government uh, in the Soviet Union. This is part of theme one, uh, which is all about that. And the, the big questions here would be why did Lenin establish a one party state? Um, although bear in mind that the essay questions in part A, where the political and economic questions are more frequently situated, can only be a, a minimum of 10 years long. So they could get around that by asking a question from 1917 to 28, of course. Um, but you're more likely to get a second type of question, perhaps, which would be how is Lenin's communist one party state different or similar um, to later versions under Stalin or Khrushchev or Brezhnev? And indeed, the exam board have deliberately flagged up the idea that students will need to understand changes in leaders' control of the state across the years 1917 to 85. They've explicitly said that in their um, outline of what you need to learn. So just pause and consider the situation of Lenin uh, in uh, October 1917. He's just seized power. This is his lifelong ambition. He's very excited. But as he looks at the situation, of course, he's in a very tricky position. Um, the Soviet Union, as they're going to be called, are in uh, stuck in the First World War uh, and it's going very badly for them. And not only that, but the First World War itself is draining the economy of, of any life that it had in it. And that was limited to start with. There's very poor amounts of industry um, and uh, a growing agricultural crisis due to partly due to the state of the economy and partly due to um, a lot of the troops and, and animals and livestock being taken away from um, the farms and used um, in the military. Added to that, the Bolshevik party that Lenin headed up was a small party of professional revolutionaries and they'd been very effective at seizing power, but they had limited support um, even amongst the other socialist groups and considerable opposition. And that opposition grew um, as time went on. So they're in a very, very tricky position. And in that position, it's not surprising, perhaps, that Lenin chose to implement a one party state. However, at the beginning, it's not necessarily what he was looking to do. So if we wind back slightly and think about the actual um, government uh, political situation um, at the time of the revolution, um, local uh, Soviets had been established um, across Russia, certainly across Western Russia, which were um, local councils of soldiers or uh, workers or perhaps even peasants who had gathered together to take control of their patch of land, their factory, their town, um, and, and to, to make democratic decisions. Effectively, you know, these are democratic organisations springing up from the ground. Um, and they sent representatives from across Russia, Soviet Union, as we tend to call it in this course, um, uh, to the All Russian Congress of Soviets. So from June 1917, they arrive um, in St. Uh, in Petrograd, uh, in St. Petersburg, um, and they discuss uh, Russia's future uh, there. It, it's there that Lenin says, um, and the Bolsheviks, that it's, it's this uh, all Russian Congress of Soviets that should form the basis of future government. But of course, um, that, uh, that, that Congress is uh, not just a Bolshevik Congress. It has Mensheviks and socialist revolutionaries in it and people from other parties, too. And so there are a number of people, including some um, Bolsheviks like Kamenev and Zinoviev, who believe that a broad coalition of parties will form uh, after the revolution and, and that there'll be uh, collaboration and cooperation in the running of, of Russia. And in fact, um, there are a bunch of left SRs that join uh, the initial government in, in a coalition with the Bolsheviks and even hold um, some junior ministerial role uh, roles. Yeah. Um, but, of course, this All-Russian Congress is too big to meet uh, regularly. It's very unwieldy. And so out of that um, uh, are elected a council to take day to day control. Um, and this is uh, a standard practice, really, in, in most um, governments and democracies around the world. This body uh, in Russia was called the Sovnarkom, S-O-V-N-R-A-K-O-M. And this Sovnarkom was uh, made up of 13 um, what were called people's commissars, quite grandly. Lenin was the chair. Trotsky was head of foreign affairs. Stalin was uh, in the initial subnarkom as um, um, head of the People's Commissariat of Nas Nationality Affairs, basically in charge of um, ensuring that other nationalities within uh, Russia, the Russian Empire, Soviet Union, were um, content and happy and, and go along with things. 
All of these uh, commissars were revolutionaries that had backed uh, Lenin since 1903, and many of them had worked with him in exile. And of course, there's a, a, major, a majority Bolshevik, in fact, probably all Bolsh Bolsheviks there. So immediately, the Bolsheviks are um, uh, taking power for themselves, even though there's this sense of, of wider representation in the, in the body beneath them and in some collaboration with them through the left SRs. Two things happen to really, uh, well, three things happen really to put um, a big dent in that idea of, of this broad coalition. The first one is that it had already been arranged that in January 1918, 1918, a constituent assembly would be elected. This constituent assembly was kind of like a parliament and its job was going to be to meet um, and to create a new constitution for Russia. Remember, you know, the old Tsar's gone and a provisional government's been put in place, but there's not a permanent government. And that's what this constituent assembly uh, is elected to um, to achieve you know, a new constitution. And this is how we're going to work from now on. Those elections are allowed to take place, which in itself suggests that maybe Lenin hadn't decided he was going to have a one party state dictatorship. Maybe. Um, but those elections um, don't go so well for the Bolsheviks. They do win 175 seats. They do get 9 million votes, which sounds quite impressive. But the socialist revolutionaries gather 410 seats and 21 million votes. Now, clearly, this is uh, uh, not a ringing endorsement of Lenin, although they're a small party. So it's kind of expected, I, I guess. What happens is the Constituent Assembly meets but only for one day. And uh, Trotsky and um, some Red Guards um, turn up and uh, shut it down forcefully um, and say that actually power, all power, must reside in the hands of the Soviets. The Constituent Assembly is um, consigned to the dustbin of history, says Trotsky. So this is the first step towards um, a centralised one-party state uh, by effectively ignoring these elections and cancelling the, the Constituent Assembly. The second step occurs with uh, one of Lenin's key policies. Lenin um, is very clear right from the start that the First World War has to finish, that, that Russia has to get out of it um, and that they will um, have to surrender um, to Germany and, and sue for peace. Now, they do that straight away. But of course, leaving the war in that sort of circumstance leaves them at the mercy of Germany and Germany. Um, are all too happy to uh, to take advantage of this. This leads in March 1918 to the Treaty of Brest-Litovsk. Um, Russia really had no uh, no ability to fight back, but this is a very, very, very harsh treaty. And you probably have some awareness of the Treaty of Versailles. This is very similar in its, um, in its pitch and in its tone. So Russia was going to be um, uh, made to pay, for instance, 3,000 million rubles in damages. And it was going to lose the Ukraine, Finland, the Baltic states of Lithuania, Latvia and Estonia and parts of Poland were lost as well. There are huge tracts of land, huge tracts of really good land as well. Land that um, was agricultural. Some, a lot of their industry was, was in this land in, in, in the western um, part of Russia. So this was a humiliating um, and um, very punitive um, treaty. But they're in no, no position to fight against this, literally in no position to fight against it. They don't have an army and uh, things are melting down at home. So Lenin says that we must uh, sign this. There is um, notably there's a lot of debate in the party about it, a lot of disagreement in the party about it. And that's a sign that, that Lenin as a dictator is a dictator, perhaps who will listen and argue and, and um and will reach uh, a collaborative agreement. But in the end, he says that if you won't sign it, if you won't endorse the signing of it, I'm off um, and has to threaten to resign to get it through. He does get it through and people um, back it and sign it. Um, but the left SRs don't. And this is the case, uh, the point at which they leave the coalition. And from here on, from March 1918 on, there are uh, no other party representatives other than the Bolsheviks in their government. So now we've achieved a one party government. Um, and um, in the following months, uh, um, things progress even further that in April and May, there are elections to the Soviets. And again, the Communist Party do all right, but not um, that well. Lenin claims that these uh, elections are unfair. Um, and he doesn't recognize the results. Um, future elections are, are postponed. Um, and the whole thing is kind of closed down. 
In fact, interestingly, um, this also uh, triggers um, some purging uh, of the parties. Um, first of all, in May 1918, of the Communist Party itself, half of their members are kicked out of the party. They're not um, executed, but they're kicked out of the party. This is the first chistka um, or purge. Um, and then following an assassination attempt on Lenin himself in August 1918, um, a lot of SRs are arrested. By 1921, further you know, arrests of SRs and Mensheviks have mean that they're completely debilitated. And by 1922, there are no other political parties. Now, um, next time we'll talk about uh, perhaps censorship and the impact of, of the civil war. But this is the sort of gradual process by which um, Lenin uh, established a one party state. It's important to remember that whilst he may have in intended it, and ideologically the idea of a dictatorship of the proletariat is a Marxist um, a pol a policy statement, um, and it makes sense looking back that they would end up being in a one party state. Uh, that said, there is a sort of uh, a reactive element to the policies that Lenin had, um, and they emerge over time and in particular situations. And so um, I think if you could characterise this um, as a gradual development of a one party state uh, where um, elections are held and then afterwards, because the results didn't go well, parties are, are removed and banned and um, people are arrested. And that over time and in the context of the civil war, there is a growing centralization, but that it's um, a slightly erratic and chaotic development of um, that process. We'll pick up on this next time uh, when we look a little bit more at the other things that are going on in these uh, initial years. But I hope that's helpful in terms of the structure of, of the um, government and I will see you next time.